The Gospels make it clear that following Jesus is an all-encompassing, highly demanding, awesome, amazing adventure. And when Jesus called people, he didn't hold back from telling them just what it was they were letting themselves in for. He said to the fishermen who were trying to earn a decent living, drop your nets, leave all that behind you now and come, follow me. On another occasion, two people offered to follow Jesus and one was approached by him and yet he turned to all three of them and said something off-putting, something hard that probably deterred them from ever following him. And in today's reading, we hear of a rich young ruler who wanted to follow Jesus. But he was told, OK, but first, go and sell all that you have and then come and follow me. You can just imagine what the disciples thought as they watched these potential recruits go on their way, having seen their enthusiasm crushed by the weight of what Jesus had said. You can't help but feel that they would have chosen someone else to be their membership secretary, someone a bit more positive. But Jesus wanted people to know what following him was all about. And although we might look at the account of Jesus and the rich young ruler and think, well, that didn't go well, the truth is that there's a lot in that exchange that can tell us what following Jesus is all about. In fact, there's an amazing sentence nestling in the heart of today's Gospel reading. It says, Jesus looked at him, that is the rich young man. He looked at him and he loved him. Jesus knew that this man would prove incapable of loving him in return. And yet he loved him. This is something to do with the pain of unrequited love. It's the same pain felt by the father in the parable of the prodigal son when his son asks, for a share of the inheritance, effectively saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. And then the son turns his back on him. It's the pain felt by God as he aches for his people to respond to his love, and yet they don't. And yet they don't. The Bible is, in a sense, a story of unrequited love, of God loving us and of us making a mess of things, believing wrongly that we can make a better fist of things without God, and then of our ending up beaten and broken and lost. But all the time, all the time, God loves us. The tragedy of the story of the rich man is that he was incapable of receiving such love, let alone reciprocating. What must I do? He asked. That was the basis of his relationship, not love, not grace, but duty. Earning his place in God's affections. Now, none of us, not one of us, is free from this urge to justify ourselves, to give God a reason to love us, to earn a place in God's affections. But that's just not how it works. God loves us even when we've turned our back on him, even when we have disowned him, even when we leave no room for him in our busy, busy lives. God loves us and God longs for us, aches for us to love him in return. God so loved the world, said St. John, that he sent his son. And God in Jesus has dealt with the mess that we've made of our lives and he's restored us to a right relationship with himself. But God does not do this grudgingly in the way that we might clear up after a messy child or a muddy dog, muttering under our breath as we wash the floor and wipe down the furniture. No, God did what he did as a gracious and loving act. He did it because he loves you. In our coming together as church, if it's about anything, then it's about celebrating and living in the light of God's love. A love that knows no shadow of alteration or change. A love that is just there. God looks at you the way Jesus looked at the rich young ruler. And he loves you. So, after loving the rich man, Jesus affirms the good that he's done. You know the commandments, he says. And so Jesus proceeds to list the demands the commandments that flesh out what it means to love our neighbour. This man, this rich young ruler, had kept every one of the Ten Commandments that were to do with loving one's neighbour. This man was a good man. Many today would describe him as a Christian, for his morals were impeccable. He was loving, caring, compassionate. But there was one thing that he lacked. And what's more, he was probably frustrated. He knew that there was more to life than just trying to be good. He would have known that that alone was not fulfilling. So here's the truth, rarely shared. There is something missing in most people's lives. There is a gap, a hole, a something that is as yet unfulfilled. 
I was really struck a few years ago listening to interviews with James Corden, you know, the carpool karaoke guy who played Smithy and Gavin and Stacey, but is now best known as the host of America's The Late Late Show. Well, in an interview with Heat magazine, he talked about a point earlier in his career when he got caught up with his newfound celebrity. He was partying and ending nights, as he put it, in beds I'd never slept in before, with girls I'd never met before. He said the longer it went on, the emptier my soul felt. You see, it's that hole again, that sense that something's missing. In an interview with BBC Radio 4 back in 2012, James Gordon talked about the moment when his fast-paced lifestyle, drinking and several failed relationships, had left him depressed, empty and alone. His star was rising in the UK, but his own behaviour at TV awards shows had embarrassed him. Ashamed, he sat alone in his London apartment. The person I had become, he said, wasn't the person I wanted to be. He explained the moment to the Daily Mail. I had drifted so far from family and friends that I didn't really know how to pick up the phone and talk to them anymore. I was lost and needed to find myself. It was at that moment that his parents, a couple who James has called the ideal Christians, showed up unannounced. They sat on the tiny two-seater sofa and I sat on the floor, he said. I was just talking to the floor, really. I felt embarrassment that they were seeing me like this, so embarrassed about so many things, about the way I'd behaved or acted at points over that seven or eight month period. My dad just stood up and walked across to where I was and he just put his arms around me and said, you've just got to get through this, son. I started to cry just as you do when your dad hugs you and you are 30. My mum came over and joined us and we sat there. My dad said, I'm going to say a prayer for you. It will be all right, but you can't carry on like this. And only you can decide what happens now. James says, every tear that left my eyes made me feel a little lighter. Dad said a prayer as he kissed my forehead. A mum came, came over and joined the hug. I've no idea how long we stayed there, but it felt like a lifetime. When they left later on, Dad turned to me and said, you've got so much to be thankful for, James. I know it's been a tricky year, but you can't carry on like this. It was a life-changing moment. Do you know, St. Benedict said in his rule of life, never lose hope in God's mercy. Never lose hope in God's mercy. God looks at you and he loves you. He knows that unless you receive that love, unless you respond to his grace, then something deep inside of you will ache. As James Corden said, the longer things went on, the emptier my soul felt. Jesus affirmed the good that this rich young man in our reading had done. But he also knew that for that man, doing good was not good enough. One thing he lacked. And so having loved him and having affirmed the good that he'd done, Jesus then presented him with a full challenge of the gospel. The commandments that he kept were all to do with loving one's neighbour. But what about his love for God? The first and great commandment is this. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. And you should not give worth to idols or give them undue respect. This man had great wealth, and that wealth had become for him an idol, a god. You know, it's hard, as Jesus said, it's hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus' reply to the rich young man didn't sound like good news to him, despite the rich overtones of grace. You know, sometimes if you have nothing, then you can respond to the call of the gospel with a certain abandonment, an uncomplicated totality because you have so little to lose and are ready for anything. But this man had a lot to lose, a lot to give up. The rich young ruler could not respond to the call of the gospel because he could not free himself from his material possessions. He couldn't give himself fully to God. He had too much to lose. And so he chose to do nothing. Following Jesus means giving up everything. It means giving him our soul, our life, our all. I've already mentioned St. Benedict, who in his rule of life said, never lose hope 
in God's mercy. But I was thinking about him again this week as in morning prayer we had the verse in Psalm 119, verse 116. It's a verse that a monk or nun uh, will, will sing three times when they make their vows for life. And the verse says this, Receive me, Lord, according to your word and I shall live. And do not disappoint me in the promise you have given me. Or in Latin, Sushipi mi Domine. These are the words sung as well for that Benedictine monk or nun by the other brothers or sisters in their community on the occasion of their death as their coffin is lowered into the grave recalling a life given, a promise made. Esther Duval in her reflections on the rule of Saint Benedict writes, We stand daily before God with empty hands, just like the publican. So me, accept me, O Lord, as you have promised, and I shall live. Do not disappoint me in my hope. These are the words, she says, that I come back to time and again as a prayer for myself. They mean more now that I have learnt that the Latin word comes from the verb subcapare, to take underneath, and so with the idea of supporting, raising, and that in Roman usage it was a word used for a father taking up a newborn infant from the ground and thus recognising it as his own. So she says when I say sushipi me, it conveys the full depth and warmth of that word. Accept me, receive me, support me, raise me up. Wonderful singing words that say everything I want to say as a prayer for myself. They're the words that I understand at one level today as I say them now and as I present myself before God. But just as a Benedictine monk or nun uses these words as they offer themselves to God, so this is about giving to God all that we are and all that we have. Again, Esther Duval says, if I really hang myself over, making an act of personal surrender, asking God to accept me just as I am now, open, vulnerable, powerless, then I shall also be able to receive whatever he has in store for me in the future. That's what the rich young man could not do. He couldn't surrender himself to God. He couldn't give God all that he was and all that he had. But that is precisely what we are called to do. We're called, in the words of John Wesley, to freely and wholeheartedly yield all things to God's pleasure and disposal. So here, then, is what following Jesus is all about. It's about love. God looks at you and he loves you. It's about never losing hope in God's mercy. It's about giving ourselves fully to God. Following Jesus is an all-encompassing, highly demanding, awesome, amazing adventure. And it demands your soul, your life, your all. Amen.